Today's topic is ethical decision making in business, and this is a test, one additional test. Thank you very much. Let's hope it works. Hello, today's uh, lecture is on ethical decision making in business. Um, the business environment has definitely changed, and I can recall about 15 to 20 years ago, there was a common joke that went something like, um, is that an oxymoron? Whenever people mention the word ethics and business in the same sentence. Um, today we're going to talk about the new environment in which young professionals are entering. Um, this new environment is much more mindful about the central role that ethics needs to play in the business arena. So um, first we're gonna start with just a few examples of, of ingrained expectations we have regarding um, ethical business practices. Within advertising, for example, we all um, are aware that there's an expectation that advertising um, is true, truthful and that it's honest and that it doesn't include uh, misleading or manipulative information. Uh, uh, one industry that's really uh, being discussed a lot in terms of um, marketing and um, truthfulness in marketing um, is the food industry. Many food companies are being um, expected to list clearly, a uh, list in a very forthright manner, the ingredients of the foods, uh, for example. Uh, there's a lot of consumer advocacy relating to nutrition labels and um, in listing of ingredients. Uh, we know that contracts are expected to be fair uh, to all parties, expected to be clearly written and uh, reasonably uh, user-friendly um, in terms of the clarity and simplicity of language. Uh, in personal selling, salespeople are increasingly uh, ex expected to adhere to ethical selling practices. Uh, per, while salespeople are, of course, ex, um, expected to be persuasive and um, it's considered reasonable that salespeople would use persuasive tactics, um, while persuasiveness is encouraged, manipulation is not. So we have all of these various examples of um, standards and ethical guidelines um, that we expect various aspects of a business to adhere to. Even suppliers. So we know that large companies like Nike, for example, worldwide, huge companies um, in the past, uh, well, Nike has been targeted and um, people have pro uh, protested against their some of their business uh, practices and raised questions about the ethics of Nike's practices since the 70s. Um, but one point of contention has been that Nike um, early on partnered with suppliers um, often in other countries um, who did not meet ethical standards of U.S. consumers. So, for example, the suppliers were accused of being sweatshops. Um, they were criticized for hiring young workers, laborers, and those sorts of things. So we now have expectations that even the suppliers that businesses partner with adhere to ethical guidelines. Pricing is another issue. I can also refer to an example of Nike. When the Michael Jordan shoe first came out in the mid-80s, uh, the price, pricing of the shoe, there was a, a large um, markup on the shoe compared to the actual cost of producing the shoe. So many people raised ethical questions surrounding um, Nike's pricing of the Michael Jordan shoe. People ask the question, is it ethical to price a shoe with such a high markup, a shoe that is largely targeted to a population that cannot afford such a price uh, pricing? So um, these are some examples of ways that we know that uh, ethical business is expected to be conducted. So whereas the paradigm that companies are here to make profits is an older paradigm, that paradigm has recently changed uh, to uh, one whereby businesses are more mindful 
of the central role that ethics needs to play in the and all of the aspects um, of its of business. So again, ethical unethical practices by suppliers, uh, use of child labor and forced labor, production in sweatshops, violation of basic rights of workers, ignoring health, safety, and environmental standards. So these are some of the ethical issues that uh, people have, um, particularly in the U.S. and uh, with companies who partner with partners or suppliers where their products are made and manufactured um, with suppliers who do not adhere to ethical guidelines. So the question becomes, can a business consider itself ethical, a business such as Nike, and ignore the unethical practices of its supplier. Now, just a word about Nike. Um, like I said, Nike people have protested against and raised questions about the ethical uh, policies of Nike since the 70s. And since that time, as, uh, Nike has um, made lots of improvements. They have at times, um, in the, at, at times uh, they have made improvements and some of their choices have not been the most ethical. Um, if I, I believe that at one point they were in, they were in certain countries, I believe Taiwan was one, and that when the standard of living w raised in that country and the workers began to have higher expectations around pay, that Nike moved to, would move to a different location. Now that was in the 70s and 80s. Uh, since then, Nike has, um, partly as a result of consumer advocacy, uh, largely uh, spearheaded by college students at Brown University and college students throughout the country, uh, Nike has since installed many uh, ethical guidelines and have made much greater attempts to self-regulate and monitor its own ethical policy. Increasingly, businesses have to be concerned with the behavior of all the businesses that operate within its supply chain. Their suppliers uh, are expected to be ethical. Their contractors, their distributors, as well as their sales agents, their sales team are expected to be trained and in ethics and to adhere to ethical practices. So companies have a lot of external pressure. Um, the rise of uh, the online and internet access, for example, many consumer advocacy groups are use those online resources to exert external pressure onto companies so that um, these pressure groups constitute really um, an external stakeholder for companies. So this is the new business environment. Um, direct consumer action, or DCA, is another way in which business ethics can be challenged by consumers, investors, uh, workers, a uh, variety of stakeholders are now increasingly calling for uh, companies to, to be more ethical in its practices. Of course, some consumer action can be positive in that companies such as Fairtrade, um, organizations, excuse me, such as Fairtrade actually monitor and keep a record and promote companies that they believe act responsibly and ethically in their business practices. And so uh, they support businesses with a strong ethical stance. And so this can increasingly for companies um, increase their profits when they have a reputation of being ethical uh, in their practices. So um, of course it would seem obvious that yes, ethical practices are good, but um, this is a controversial issue because, again, the previous dominant model in business was that the purpose of a business is to make a profit and, and that the business did not need to uh, focus on uh, social or moral concerns. And increasingly, um, that model is changing. But just some key advantages, of course, we can think of several advantages for companies, a better reputation can lead to higher revenue, improved brand and business recognition and awareness, better employee motivation in that employees can feel good when they believe or they perceive that they are working for an ethical company. 
um, some disadvantages that are often claimed in terms of the disadvantages of putting ethics, making ethics a central part of a, a business model. Uh, some claim disadvantages include, include higher costs. It takes a lot of money, uh, more money, to train uh, people into ethics, and you have to be more selective in terms of the suppliers and the people you partner with. You may have to uh, forego partnering with a supplier uh, um, who you can make a larger profit with because that supplier is uh, maybe has some unethical or questionable practices. And as a result, you'd have to go partner with a supplier who has higher ethical practices, but who charges more and thus decrease a, a business's profit. So these are some of the claims, uh, popular, popular disadvantage and disadvantages. And I know that Nike has paid um, tens of millions of dollars to institute um, different ethical guidelines uh, throughout the company. So cost is one of the major disadvantages. Uh, claims for uh, focusing on ethics in a business. And of course, uh, some claim that there's a danger of building up false expectations. And some feel that just um, that a business should be able to focus on a business and profit as opposed to incorporating morality, ethical um, guideline, especially when you're dealing with cross-cultural uh, differences. And so some believe, uh, some claim that one disadvantage of ethics is that it uh, attempts to institute one broad ethical standard for different people and different cultures when no such standard um, might exist. So in other words, if a supplier operates in a country where the legal working age is 14, um, why should a business, an American business, assume that that is unethical just because um, working at 14 is against the law in the U.S.? So these are some of the claim disadvantages or problem, problems or issues, challenges related to business uh, and ethical, excuse me, related to the ethics of conducting business and instituting ethics in business practice. So um, we've talked a little about ethics in terms of some of the ways that we all are aware of how ethics is a part of the business conversation. But for this next section, I want to really get clear and on the same page in terms of what is ethics, because many people have different ideas about what ethics is, and that's actually part of what makes ethical discussions challenging. So for the purposes of our discussion today, uh, these uh, let's talk about uh, what ethics is and what ethics is not for our purposes. So ethics are standards of behavior, uh, standards that guide how people ought to act, how humans ought to behave in a given situation. So ethics are multifaceted. They affect the personal, the professional, uh, friends, family, business, community, uh, society, nation, world, etc. Acting, acting ethically as individuals, creating ethical organizations, creating ethical governments and ethical communities, um, all of these are part of what ethics is. Conversations about these, are, these issues are what ethics focuses on. Um, what ethics is not? Ethics is, first of all, all, not the same as feelings. While our feelings definitely let us know when we're uncomfortable or unsure about which uh, set of behaviors or which way to respond to a situation, um, our feelings are definitely informative. And some people have a highly developed sense of intuition and feeling. Um, while that is true, it is important to note that ethics are very behavioral based and it is not based on feelings, which feelings and emotions tend to change uh, depending on the day, depending on the hour uh, sometimes. And so ethics is not the same as feelings. Um, again, ethics is about behavior and action and treatment of people, um, which uh, is more consistent than feelings. Ethics is not religion. Of course, uh, most religious systems 
incorporate a very high ethical um, guidelines. However, there are many situations and scenarios that various religions do not address. Um, various scenarios that are that happen in our modern contemporary society um, that are not addressed. So ethics is not religion, uh, particularly that's important to think about in a um, religiously diverse environment such as the U.S. Ethics is not following the law. Now this is very interesting um, because many people say, well, F is the law is one standard. Um, and yes, it is. The law is indeed one standard, but the law um, is not always ethical. There have been many laws that have been repealed on the basis of their being unfair and unethical. So law can also be power-based, um, meaning that certain laws have um, are on the books now and have been in the past that benefit particular groups of people over others, uh, particularly more powerful groups of uh, people than others. Uh, for example, the term uh, landowner uh, was there were many laws designed to favor or protect the landowner in the U.S. So laws um, are often ethically uh, corrupt and um, some law systems are more overtly corrupt than others or at least more overtly unethical uh, than others. Um, so it's very important to note that ethics is not uh, merely following the law. Ethics is also um, not following culturally accepted norms. Um, like the law, there are many culturally accepted norms such as uh, South Africa's apartheid. Um, that is an example of a, a, both a law and a cultural norm that was officially sanctioned by the South African government, but was at the time and since um, considered unethical by many, many people. So ethics is not just following um, what a particular, a, a particular cultural practice. So, for example, if, um, um, well, I will just say this, the common saying that when in Rome, do as the Romans do, um, in terms of ethics, that is not a sufficient standard of ethics. So, um, lastly, ethics is not science. While social science and the physical sciences definitely help us learn a lot and understand a lot about ethics, um, ethics um, there are many things that are scientifically plausible or technologically um, plausible. So, for example, I have the technological science-based capacity to record, um, secretly record, each of my classes. Um, but is that ethical? Um, no. So, ethics is not about what is scientifically possible. It's not about science. It's not about technology. So keep those things in mind as we continue our discussion about ethics and business uh, decisions. Um, philosophers and ethicists have provided, have offered us five uh, key sources of ethical standards. Um, and you may have heard about these before in perhaps a philosophy class or other classes, but let's quickly go over these five standards are uh, five um, standards that can help people make a decision when faced with a, an ethical dilemma. Um, number one, and these are only five, and when I'm using the numbers one through five, it's not at all to suggest any type of uh, sequence or ranking. So the utilitarian approach will refer to as uh, number one. The utilitarian approach is um, uh, contends that the ethical action um, is the one that provides the most good or least harm for all parties involved. So the focus on the utilitarian approach is on the outcomes, the consequences. In other words, um, what's going to bring the greatest balance of good over bad or good over harm. Um, so the utilitarian approach, when you're faced with a decision, um, the ethical standard the ethical action should be the one that's going to bring the most good to the most, the greatest number of people. 
the a second standard is the rights approach. Uh, this approach um, contends that the ethical action that should be selected is the action that best protects and respects the moral and inherent rights of the humans involved. So um, here the rights approach basically suggests that um, people inherently have some inherent right to uh, privacy, to truth, to uh, dignity and respect, for example, and that um, the rights approach is the one that will value, demonstrate most value for those inherent rights. Increasingly, non-humans are, um, are uh, such as animals and the, uh, plants and the environment, for example, are considered um, to have inherent rights as well. And so increasingly, we're seeing uh, different advocacy groups, different environmental groups, different animal rights protection groups invoking the rights approach in their defense of ethical standards uh, that protect the uh, environment and protect animals. A third approach is the fairness or justice approach. And this ethical standard suggests that the ethical action that should be taken is the one that treats humans equally to the degree possible. Or if people are treated unequally, then they should, people should be at least treated fairly based on some defensible standard. So for example, in organ, almost most organizations in the U.S., people are paid at different levels. Some people um, are paid higher than others. And while this is not equal, there is a defensible standard uh, that's widely accepted that people with higher levels of education or higher levels of experience or highly skilled in a, for a particular job or position, that that is a defensible standard um, by, through which that justifies the unequal um, payment. However, it's, it, because it's justified, it's considered fair. So the fairness or justice approach focuses on, takes a look at in the particular situation, how are, are people treated equally and if not equally, is there a defensible reason for treating people unequally? And if there is a defensible um, reason then that it may constitute fair treatment of people. So um, one big discussion that uh, corresponds to this is the controversy over the last few decades about CEOs uh, salaries. Many CEOs of, of a lot of uh, Fortune 500 companies, for example, the CEO salaries are considered way, um, um, to many, unjustifiably high. And, and that uh, so high over what the workers and everyone else uh, makes that it is considered indefensible, that um, it's not considered fair um, and indefensible yet it's considered unfair and based on power, um, access, and entitlement, and other unfair standards. A fourth ethical approach is the common good approach. And this approach suggests that the appropriate or best ethical action is the one that contributes to a good community life, um, that con contributes to the general welfare of all persons within a, a particular community, particularly the, in, the vulnerable within that community. So um, there's a, a, the push for an effective public education system, the push for effective police departments, fire departments, parks, um, health care, et cetera, kind of uh, found one foundation for these is this notion that it's ethical and it's good to um, provide and make a, a holistic, healthy community, and that that is an, an ethical standard um, that treats the most amount of people within that community um, well. The fifth standard is the virtual approach, and here the ethical action that should be taken is the one that brings out the best in humanity, the one that is consistent with certain ideal virtues that uh, provide for the full uh, development of our 
humanity and our individual character. So the virtue approach focuses on habits, things that we do uh, that lead us to act to our highest potential, that lead us to demonstrate high levels of character, for example. Values of truth, beauty, integrity, honesty, courage, fairness, tolerance, compassion. These are all considered virtues uh, that humans, um, that when we're at our best, that we uh, demonstrate high uh, value for, for these values. Um, what kind of person will I become if I do this, for example, is one of the questions that the virtual approach um, wants people to reflect on when making an ethical decision. Uh, what kind of person will I become if I do this? Also, is this an action, is this particular action, is this particular choice reflective of my highest self or my best self? So when uh, and following the virtual approach, these are some questions that one would ask him or herself. Of course, the notion that we can come up with um, ethical standards we know is rife with challenges, especially within a diverse society. Uh, there's disagreement on the specifics about uh, the uh, of the general approaches. What constitutes the common good, for example? Um, different people have different beliefs about what should be incorporated in human rights, what should be incorporated in civil rights. So um, these are all challenges of, of agreeing upon or establishing ethical standards. There are different approaches to, approaches to answering the question, what is ethical? Um, other challenges include, on what do we base our ethical standards? If ethics should not be based on feelings or religion or law or culture, on what do we base our ethical standards? Another question, how do those standards get applied to specific situations we place? So even if we were to agree theoretically on a set, uh, on an ethical standard, how do we implement those standards in a in particular and unique situation within our contemporarily, excuse me, our contemporary and increasingly complex society? So, um, we know that ethics requires uh, increased mindfulness about choices and impacts of choices. And it is useful to have a methodology, a system for, uh, to help us, guide us when we're faced with an ethical dilemma. So the Markula Center for Applied Ethics has come up with a 10-step framework on ethical decision-making that can be useful to help uh, business professionals make ethical decisions um, that they're faced with. So the, according to Markula Center for Applied Ethics, the first thing that we need to do when faced with an ethical dilemma is to recognize, we need to become better at recognizing uh, when a particular issue has ethical implications. So um, one question we should ask is, can a person or group be damaged or harmed as a result of this? So that helps us uh, recognize if an issue is just a general issue or if we need to think about it in ethical terms. Um, is there a choice, for example, between two bad decisions, two good decisions, or one bad or one and one good decision? Is the issue more about what is legal or what is most efficient? So those can help us recognize the nature of the issue that we're faced with, if it's an ethical ethical issue or not. The next thing we need to do is get the facts about the particular situation. Uh, so we should ask ourselves, do I know, do I fully comprehend the key issues and key facts needed to make an informed decision, an ethical decision in this case? Uh, what are the right concerns of key stakeholders? We know that different stakeholders will have uh, varying um, concerns, um, and we need to be able to identify which concerns are most most uh, pressing in a particular situation, and what are my options for acting, and am I looking at the full spectrum of options, am I not, uh, we want to make sure that we're not overlooking some options um, and only focusing on others, so we should think creatively in terms of the full range of options that 
might be at our disposal um, in terms of how to act in a given situation. So I have a sample ethical question. So for the, uh, or scenario, for the communication assessment assignment, I have asked students to, uh, when they, the students are required, excuse me, to interview a member of the management team or some member of the executive team at the management level or higher. And during the interview, I have asked students to record the interview. And um, my ethical situation that I'd like to, um, for you all to think about um, as we go to this next uh, section is should permission to record the business interview for our class project, should permission be asked or sought even if the state does not require such permission? So in other words, legally, the state uh, says that only one party in the conversation needs to be aware of the recording um, in order for it to be legal. But um, what I'd like to do is to have you consider um, not only the legal standard, but the ethical standard of um, asking the other party for permission and making him or her aware that the interview is being recorded. So that brings us to step number six in the framework for ethical decision making. Uh, and step number six uh, says that we should evaluate the alternative actions that we have. So um, let's look at some of the alternative actions we have regarding the getting, um, seeking permission to record the interview or not. So um, the if we were to take one option we have is to look at this scenario from a utilitarian approach. If we were to look at it from a utilitarian approach, then we would consider which option will produce the most good and the least harm. Will asking permission to record the interview bring more harm or will not asking permission to record the interview bring less harm? So. Um, what do you think? Which option will produce most good and least harm to all parties involved? Getting permission or not getting permission? A second alternative way we can face this dilemma is to take the rights approach. The rights approach asks us to think about the option that best respects the rights of all stakeholders. And in this case, with the class project, we have uh, various stakeholders. We have the students who are um, actually conducting the interview. We have the teacher, uh, the professor who has assigned uh, the assignment. We have the business manager or member of the executive team who is participating in the interview. We have the campus. Um, um, of which the student is representing not only the particular class and the professor, but also the campus. So the rights approach will ask us to think about which option, um, letting the interview know, interviewee know that he or she is being recorded or not letting him, uh, the interviewee know that he or she is being recorded, which option best respects the rights of all who have a stake in this uh, particular assignment. A third alternative action we can take is we can look at the justice approach. And this particular approach asks us which option treats people equally, and if not equally, um, proportionately. So in other words, um, we're trying to balance the power and make sure that justice is involved. So which option treats people, puts them more on a uh, similar level field? Um, the seeking um, approval or letting the people know the interview is being recorded or not, having one party know and, and not having the other party know, which, by the way, again, is legal. But again, the justice approach is, is looking more at fairness and equality or defensible um, ways of, of treating people differently. And of course, um, um, many could argue that the law is a defensible, the legality of not seeking permission is a defensible standard uh, for, 
for having one party know the interview is being recorded and the other person, the other party not knowing. A, um, a, a fourth option is for us to take the common good approach. And here we think about the scenario and consider which option best serves the community as a whole, not just some members, but the community as a whole. And here we're thinking about this, um, the students, the business, we're thinking about the campus, we're thinking about the Fort Collins community, we're thinking about all parties within the community, um, which option best protects um, those who might be vulnerable in the community, such as the student or the business owner, and um, thinking about which option best serves the community as a whole, as a unified uh, and related, interrelated entity. Lastly, another um, alternative way we can address this dilemma is to take the virtual approach, which simply asks us to think about which option would lead me to act in my highest self or my best self. And there we'd be thinking about the virtual approach. And sometimes a, a related question for this is, if I were to, for example, ask someone that I really respect, or um, if this were to show up in a court of law, would I look better having selected the option? Would I be most proud of my choice of, for having the option to, uh, of letting the interviewee know that the interview is being recorded or not having the interviewee know um, whether it's being recorded. And of course, um, while some of the other approaches might say there's no difference, it doesn't matter, it only, the feelings doesn't matter, you know, the feeling don't matter, the feelings don't matter, um, it's just a matter of the law. For the virtual approach, those ideals, idealized situations do matter. And so um, that's how we would address the situation or answer the question when thinking of it from the virtual approach. So I'm um, continuing with the framework for ethical decision making. After evaluating the different options we have, uh, the, the next step is to make a decision on the dilemma and test it. So the the seventh step is to ask which option best addresses the situation. So we talked about five on the previous slide, five different options, the utilitarian approach, the common good, rights approach, uh, virtual approach, um, et cetera. And now here we're going to select one of those, make a decision, and, and decide which one best addresses the situation. And then number eight, we're going to think about if this became public, if this, if I were to share this um, with someone I highly respect, which, what would they say? So here we're kind of taking, not only looking at our ethical choice, but we're looking at the perception of our ethical choice and how it might look um, in a larger context, um, in a more public context. So after making a decision and testing our choice, we are in the last uh, stage of the of the decision ethical decision making framework, we're at the the last two steps, which ask us to act and reflect on the particular outcome or decision that we've made. So step number nine: How can the decision be implemented with the greatest care and attention to the concerns of stakeholders? So, in other words, whatever our decision is. And we know that it's not only what you decide, but how you implement the decision. Um, you need to be ethical about both, about what you decide and how um, your decision is implemented. So if you decide not to inform the interviewer, for example, that he or she is being interviewed, um, are there other ways that you can in incorporate um, ethics in terms of how um, how you implement that decision. So here you want to make sure that however you decide to implement the, the decision that you're showing, demonstrating care and attention and awareness to the concerns of the various stakeholders who could possibly be affected by this decision. Lastly, how did you learn, excuse me, how did the decision turn out? So after you made the decision, 
how did it turn out and what did you learn? Ethics is an ongoing learning process where we always want to learn and reflect on the decisions, the ethical decisions we've made and have though that learning be the basis of future ethical decisions uh, that we make. Ethics is ongoing. Some ethical guidelines are implicit, meaning they're not stated, but they're inferred. For example, asking you not to, asking students in a class, for example, uh, not to be disruptive or um, not to copy on someone uh, from someone's work. There's an implicit understanding that that's an ethical expectation by the time people get to the university, for example. However, plagiarism or anti-plagiarism guidelines and policies are usually incorporated into course syllabi explicitly uh, just to reinforce that important point. So whatever profession or business or industry that you choose to enter, you want to be aware that most, almost all legal professions and businesses and industries have ethical guidelines. Uh, for those of you in the field of communication studies or speech communication, there uh, the organization called National Communication Association, NCA, um, has prepared, has a list of very detailed ethical codes that uh, people in the field need to follow. Uh, journalism has its own codes, uh, you know, um, that guide their professional um, decisions and conduct. Remember, ethics is about behavior. This um, as a journalism has their own codes for guiding the conduct of journalists. Law um, has its own code as set forth by the American Bar Association. Uh, medical doctors, health practitioners have their own code set forth by the AMA, American Medical Association. So um, always know your, your ethical guidelines and be sure to adhere closely to those. In the, for those of you who are communication studies majors, you can uh, visit um, NCA's website at www.nacom. Dot org. That's www.nac.org. Uh, and if you do a keyword search for ethics, you can take a look at the ethical guidelines that shape the profession. Um, ethics, of course, have it's, it's like throwing that rock in the water. It has a ripple effect. It affects people at all levels, personal, family, community. You want to make sure that you make ethical decisions. Um, and that know that every major decision should um, incorporate ethics and that when you throw that rock and you make that decision or take that action, there will be ripple effects. So you want to be mindful about that. And you want to know that as humans, we will make mistakes. It has been said that uh, mistakes are when we forget who we are at our highest self. So um, we will have moments when we forget who we are, where we're not behaving um, in ways that align with our greatest potential, our highest self, for example. And so mistakes happen. And so ethics should not be something that you guilt, you feel bad about when you don't perform ethically. Uh, you definitely want to minimize um, unethical behaviors. Um, however, in light of, a, of an unethical deed, you want to be able to manage the mistake you want to atone and be able to manage um, your error or your uh, poor decision making effectively as well. So this is why you'll see many organizations um, hire PR people to put out apologies and the wording of those apologies are very, very important in businesses because um, people are not only judged for the mistakes if they make mistakes, but they're also um, judged in terms of how they handle the mistakes. So keep that in mind as well. Ethics affects the, all the decisions. Um, there's an ethical impact in not only what you do and how you do it, but even when you do wrong, there's an ethical um, component to how you atone or how you handle or seek um, to remedy the situation. 
In conclusion, ethics is a central aspect of decision making throughout life. So um, be very mindful of ethics. See my um, ethics as essential not only to your profession um, and to your professional behavior and conduct, but also to your personal and family and community life as well. For additional resources, uh, you can um, um, visit the website of the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics. Uh, which is located at Santa Clara University. Um, there are many other resources online that can help you become ethical decision makers um, in your business venture and endeavors. And uh, much of the information in this presentation was uh, informed by the Framework for Thinking Ethically, a website presented by the Marcula Center for Applied Ethics. And you can visit the website um, here, which is listed in the second bullet point, and um, thank you very much.